Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the next in our series of bite-sized talks that are focused on NF core pipelines. We're joined by James Fellows Yates from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany today, and he will be presenting the NF core eager pipeline. As usual, we're on Zoom, and we're also back on live tube, uh, on YouTube, sorry, live this time. So if you have any questions during the talk, please add them to the chat box at any point during the session, and I will read them out at the end. So thanks very much for volunteering to present today, James. Over to you. Thanks. So uh, today I'm going to talk about NF Core Eager, which is uh, using the GitHub description, a bioinformatics best practice analysis pipeline for NGS sequence-based ancient DNA data analysis. Um, and so in the talk today, I'll briefly introduce what paleogenomics is and why we need a special pipeline for it. I'll give a very, very brief overview of NF Core Eager, um, mainly because I've presented this many times before, but I'm happy to go into more detail at the end. And uh, also, uh, to change things slightly, I'll also talk a bit about some of the development challenges we had um, for this pipeline during DSL-1. Oops, sorry. So what is pair genomics? Um, well, pair genomics is actually a very diverse field. It's, it's all very focused on, on um, ancient DNA, um, but there's many different facets. So for example, um, there is a lot of work in human genomics, uh, which is used for studying past human history. There's also animal, particularly megafauna uh, genomics, pair genomics for studying past evolution, uh, ecology and evolution. There's microbial genomics, uh, particularly for pathogens to allow us to study um, infectious disease in the past. More recently, researchers, including myself, have started to move into studying ancient microbiomes. Um, and this has lots of facets, for example, past disease, like chronic disease, but also human behavior and so on. And also there is a lot of work now becoming particularly popular in sediment DNA um, from, for example, sequencing cores, which is also for ecology and evolution in human history. So there's many, many different facets uh, to, to this field. Um, Pagenomics is not particularly new and there have been previous pipelines. So um, specifically in this context, actually Eager or NF Core Eager is not a new pipeline. It's a new variant or, or, or refactored version of a pipeline developed by Alex Peltzer about yeah, five, six years ago. Um, and this is the diagram that was in the, the publication. And as you can see here, there's three main sections, which is pre-processing or fast Q files. For example, quality control and then um, vector removal and merging in PEDA data, read mapping uh, with deduplication, and then finally genotyping or variant calling with a variety of methods and optional um, consensus calling. Now, you might be thinking that sort of three stages of pre processing, mapping, genotyping is pretty standard. You know, SARIC, and of course, SARIC also does that in many ways. Um, except the difference here is that ancient DNA is very, very shitty, to put it bluntly. Um, it's very fragmented, it's very short, it's also damaged, and it also um, is full of contamination from modern DNA, so from ourselves or the environment around you. And this complicates things in, in um, a variety of ways. So to, to sort of visualize this a bit, um, with fragmentation, what happens, what I mean by that is that over time, with no repair mechanisms, DNA that was in a cell will basically be um, exposed to various chemical and other processes, which causes the DNA strands to break into smaller and smaller and smaller fragments. And this means that they can get very, very short, almost in general, even down to about 30 base pairs, which is so short that um, you have very low specificity. So it means that either when you're mapping to a single genome, it can map to multiple places in, in, on, a, yeah, on the genome. Um, but also when you're doing taxonomic profiling, so if you match genomics, like when you're doing microbiome work, um, it means that your DNA fragments or reads can map to many different um, species. Then um, in addition to this, because of this fragmentation, many of these reads are slowly lost over time. Um, meaning that you actually can often get very few true ancient DNA fragments in your library. And so you generally end up with low coverage, either depth and or breadth in many cases, which means you don't have particularly high um, confidence in, for example, variant calling and so on. On top of this, um, we have damage. So this fragmentation process I explained at the beginning, that is not clean. It doesn't always end in clean um, 
uh, sort of breaks or growth strands. So sometimes you have these single stranded overhangs, which exposes the nucleotides um, on this strand that it still exists um, to, again, other um, degradation processes, particularly deamination, where you lose the amine group, causing cytosine, so most commonly causing cytosine to, to turn into uracils, which then uh, during uh, library construction, when you repair the ends, uh, so blunt end repairing, gets it misincorporated on the other strand as, as thymines. So in addition to having the low coverage, we also have these sort of fake mutations or fake substitutions, which again, uh, further complicates um, uh, variant calling. And on top of this, we have this issue of contamination, which I mentioned in the previous slide, which is where basically DNA in the burial environment, in the storage environment after it's excavated by the excavators, by the lab people, all of this co contributes lots of DNA from other species, other organisms, but also, let's say you're dealing with human remains, you'll also get a lot of um, human DNA from the workers themselves, all being able to map to the same reference genome. And trying to distinguish between these uh, adds another um, uh, issue. So, while this shitty DNA does make things very difficult, it on the other hand actually helps us to distinguish between ancient DNA and modern DNA. And that means that has been developed a, a range of authentic, authentication criteria to help you separate what is the true ancient DNA from the organism you want to study versus all the rest. And so this includes things like damage profiles. So this uh, frequency of increased frequency of C to T um, substitutions at the end of molecules is one. Then there's fragment length distributions do all of your DNA molecules actually fall in at the small end of um, yeah of these sort of distributions? Edit distances to see, okay, is the, um, do you have something that's basically a relative of your actual species? And so you have quite a far edit distance, many mutations. And also by, when you're looking at metagenomics, so microbiome work, trying to um, look, does the majority of the, the, the taxa or species you're finding in your ancient sample look sort of similar to what we know from modern? So for example, if you've got ancient paleofeces, so ancient poop, um, do you see a lot of gut taxa that we know in modern uh, human DNA? And actually, paleogenomics has been around, or paleogenomics has been around really since the, the NGS revolution, so maybe 15, 20 years or so. And it's actually since then become actually quite easy to get ancient DNA. There's a lot of lab developments, which means we can quite regularly and routinely get pretty good um, samples. However, it's almost too good in a sense. So particularly in the human population genetics field, um, they are routinely, de routinely dealing with data sets of thousands of samples and adding hundreds of samples per, per publication. And the issue with previous pipelines like Eager one as I displayed a couple of slides ago, is that these are not designed for HPCs. They're very linear, so one sample at a time, even if they may, may be multi-threaded, or they would only be able to work on a single node. They couldn't be distribu distributed across multiple nodes, as we commonly deal with, with HPCs, which are becoming also more common even at national level. And on top of this, the field is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. Like I said before, there's many different facets of the field. And this also means that you have a lot of, lot of different people trying to come in and study, ask different questions from different angles. One example is a lot of human population genetic studies are also now trying to combine this in a single study with pathogen detection. So are also asking as well as sort of the ancestry of these individuals, did they die of some infectious disease like Yersinia pestis that caused them like death? And the solution uh, that at least we came up with, that Alex started and I have continued, is um, converting the, the original Eager pipeline and extending it uh, into Nexto. And we did this with an thing called Eager. And um, I'm only going to briefly go through this. If you have more questions specifically about the pipeline, you can ask questions at the end. Um, again, we still have the basic genomics pipeline steps of pre-processing, so adaptive removal, from adaptive removal, fast QC for quality control, then mapping with a variety of mappers and evaluating this, for example, quality map. Then we have ancient DNA specific section, which allows us to um, modify depending on what the damage or fragmentation you have in there. So either filtering for reads with damage or removing the damage in silico. That happens at a variety of processes here. Variant calling again and consensus calling, but also with specific um, uh, new consensus callers, which allow you to check, for example, when doing pathogen genomics, whether you have environmental relatives. So for example, when you're looking at TB, there's a lot of TB, uh, TB relatives in the soil. So you can check that with multi-PCF analyzer. We've extended the number of statistics that gets generated from here. For example, very routinely now, people are um, able to estimate um, 
biological sex of individuals uh, with low coverage data, and also checking for, for example, um, the genome uh, annotation, so checking if there's certain genes are present and absent throughout um, the evolution of, of, of a species. But the most important extension, at least in my personal opinion, is basically the metagenomic screening. So taking the off target reads from the mapping to, for example, the human genome, allowing you to basically taxonomic pro taxonomically profile these either to generate profiles for microbiome analysis, also, um, but for um, pathogen detection, and also, again, importantly, authenticating these hits that you may find. So this is another representation of the graph before, um, but more detailed, so in just how complex the pipeline is. So um, we have uh, these three different um, main routes as we sort of classify it. You've got the eukaryotic nuclear genomes. This is normally for humans and animal genomics. And with this route, you have things like nuclear contamination estimation or sex determination. Um, and particular variant calls there, but also for the microbes as small as genomes, must I say, so mitochondrial or, or yeah, plasmid genomes or uh, microbial genomes, we have these additional feature estimations, oh, sorry, uh, statistics generations, but also um, these additional consensus callers. And then also on top of that, we have the metagenomic component where we do the taxon profile and so on. So it's a very, very complex pipeline. Um, and this is why I want to talk today a little bit about the main development challenges we had during at least the DSL-1 version. I'm hoping some of these uh, issues will be alleviated in DSL-2, but we, that it remains to be seen. Um, so the first issue is complex input data. So what I mean by this is that there are many different weird and wonderful ways that people generate data that would go into the pipeline. So for example, it is also possible to remove damage um, in, in the lab uh, using various protocols there. And this can be in various forms, either no damage removal at all, partial damage removal or full damage removal, all which means you would have to have different settings within Eager to, to process that accordingly. There's many different sequencing configurations. So people will mix both paired and single end data, and then also a variety of Illumina sequences and now also BGI um, uh, data all in a single run because they will either sequence their their genomes across many, or sorry, libraries across many machines to get high coverage or are experimenting with other things. And that, again, means that all of the different processing has to have be customized accordingly. And also is very heterogeneous input files. So um, some people will start with FastQ, sometimes some people will uh, start with BAM. Some people only upload their BAM files and not their raw FastQ files, but you still need to include this in. Um, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes these have already been adapter clipped, sometimes not. And this is very, very, very complex and messy, very much like a big spaghetti um, hoop, ball spaghetti. And so our solution here was firstly adopting the TSV input, which uh, came sort of partway through the DSL-1 series of pipelines that we had in NFCore. We adapted heavily from SARIC. But um, more importantly here, what we did is we made extensive use of something I called rerouting which is basically using channel branching, filtering within that, and then basically merging again here. And we basically had to do this in almost every single main step of the pipeline um, because of this very large variety of ways that people would um, yeah, give input data into the, into the pipeline. So this example here, um, it's for poly-G trimming, which you can only apply to NovaSeq or NextSeq data because you get these poly-G tails uh, when no um, base is called, no light is emitted. But we had to make sure that you split based on that because you don't want to run the PolyG stuff on the HiSeq or MySeq data because that does not apply, that artifact. But in some cases, um, people would not want to run that anyway, but we still have to, in the next flow paradigm, make the channel. So we had to make this option here. And then we always had to make sure that we merged them together before sending downstream. And so this makes the pipeline quite complicated, but actually was relatively efficient once we got, got a hang of it. The next thing, as I said before, this is a very interdisciplinary field. We have biometricians who genuinely know what they're doing, but we have genomicists, ecologists, archaeologists, osteologists, historians, and even amateur genealogists, all trying to um, uh, play with data. Given that ancient DNA, the field as a whole, is actually very, very good at uploading the raw data. I think there was a study even 10 years ago, which said that something like 95% of raw sequencing data from ancient DNA papers are uploaded, for example, to ENA or SRA. So a lot of people um, want to try this out. But what that meant is that um, 
we have the challenge of trying to communicate how to run the pipeline, how to train people to run the pipeline. Also, in the context that ancient DNA is small enough, that there's not many sort of, there's not Coursera courses or like um, you know, many university courses that allow you to get trained in this sort of thing. And the solution for us, or for me at least, and that's how I got involved uh, while Alex was doing the uh, early um, phase of the project, which was documentation, 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 documentation. So much so actually, as a side note, that uh, Phil and Maxime and Hashel started complaining because I had dumped, I'd written so much documentation just running for NF Core Eager for these people from a variety of places that um, they were so, they were actually relevant to the NF Core as a whole, um, but I kept on thinking into the Eager, Eager sort of documentation files. So I had to move them eventually. Um, however, because I was writing so much and the pipeline was so complicated, this made the documentation very dry and very long. And so the question there was how to keep it very, keep it more interesting. So it's more, people are more willing to actually read it as well. And the solution here was that I recruited Zandra uh, Feganes to basically draw these nice little schematic images um, uh, of the output of various tools as displayed in multi-QC and with little notes and hints on how to actually interpret this. Because a lot of the tools, for example, FastQC would report an ancient DNA library looking really bad and failing a lot of metrics, but actually that's just because ancient DNA is a bit different um, and you don't shouldn't follow that. But by having these images, it helps people to very quickly identify, okay, this weird like failure might be okay. Um, and in addition to this, we made sure we tried to construct this in a way that could be reused um, as broad training material. So meaning that other people in their own lectures at different universities can incorporate some of these very basic and routine steps of, of any NGS project or any NGS data, but are often not taught, particularly to people coming from archeology span or uh, maybe even ecology in some cases. Uh, and we hope that by doing this, a lot of the students coming in to work on ancient DNA and particularly use the eager pipeline, they'll be educated before they run it. And so it will reduce the amount of Slack messages and um, emails and stuff we get about with questions about running pipeline. And the final thing was um, that there are lots of opinions and no real standards uh, in the field. So ancient DNA can be very, very competitive, particularly human population genetics. You have a few um, very big, very powerful and rich labs running this, but all in, yeah, crazy rat races to be the first to get the next uh, nature paper of the next region of the world. And what this meant is that there was constantly changing standards. Um, so what I actually mean there is a strong opinion. So a lot of these big labs will say, no, this is how you must, you must do your data analysis, use these settings and so on. Um, but this kept changing over time because either they would come to the next thing they want to do and change it, or even um, different labs will show that their settings are better. And so this made it very difficult for us to know which tools or parameters were um, were best to use for this type of data. Um, and this actually, our solution to this started quite early on. So actually Alex developed a little tool, for example, for telling you um, or helping you estimate the, the most optimal mismatch rate for BWA align um, during seeding, I think it is. Um, so developing a little tool ecosystem around this, that we also have some internal tools as well, but this is, these are developing wider and wider, which sort of feeds in and out of Eager itself. To cope with the changing and shifting standards, I repeatedly use Twitter as a Twitter hive mind to basically get what the general majority is, uh, uh, opinion of settings and so on, or at least what people most routinely use. For example, in the example here, where people sequence single impaired end, which allowed us to improve our defaults in, in, the, in the pipeline. And also I repeatedly, repeatedly presented in many different contexts um, uh, the pipeline in, introduced it. So much so in many of the ancient DNA conferences, people got a bit fed up because it's the same thing over and over again. But this is very important to capture as many different people from many different fields um, to try out the pipeline and to get their opinions of how things should be set up and, and defaults and so on and other extra functionality that may be people interested. And on top of this, I also offered um, workshops and help people set it up uh, in their in their basic institutions, particularly as many of these smaller engineering labs don't have bioinformatics support or have very minimal. Um, and so by offering these workshops directly, it got them up to speed much, much, much faster. And they also distributed, particularly in other countries, um, the knowledge within their own um, communities. So to summarize, um, paleogenomics is complicated. There's a lot of different topics going on. Uh, the DNA is pretty shitty and is 
very complicated in terms of processing, but this is actually a fun challenge, one of the fun things to do, uh, wh or why it attracts people like me to the, the field. Um, I would suggest that writing very broad documentation actually helps, particularly when you're working with very interdisciplinary fields and you have lots of different people coming in, both from the point of view that it gets people to stop spamming your Slack uh, uh, channels, but also emails. Um, but it also makes a nice community around that. And a lot of people are very grateful for this when you write quite extensive documentation, not just doing the bare minimum, just this is the settings and you can work out what settings you want to run. Um, and finally, my other recommendation would be to be active in out outreach, not just support, so not just answering questions of bugs and so on, but actually try and sell your pipeline. Um, it keeps a project alive past publication. So, for example, already in the upcoming hackathon, there's three or four people who are volunteering to help out with Eager, and hopefully that means that um, the pipeline will last a lot longer and just have uh, support the community um, and the ancient DNA fields for much longer than a lot of these typical bioinformatic pipelines or software and tools that get abandoned once the PhD student has graduated. And so, yeah, to sum up, the repository is, of course, on GitHub and under the NFCore organization. We have a few um, specific tutorials for running the Eager pipeline in the different contexts. So like the human genomics, pathogen and microbiome work, as I explained earlier. We've got the Slack channel. Uh, we published the paper earlier this year in PHA. And finally, I'd like to thank Alex, of course, who for sort of the granddaddy of Eager and still uh, existing there in the clouds, but also the co-developers um, and everyone who basically uh, reported bugs and tests and, and so on. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, James. Yes, there are questions. So Maxime has this question. Uh, he's, he asks, is there such a thing as ancient cancer DNA? Yes, there is. Um, I don't know if it's published yet. Alex knows a bit more about that, but that, that is a thing, yes. And it's coming soon, I believe. Okay. We did not get the grant. Sorry. So we did not get a grant. So I think there are some people working on topics like that, but in the end, um, it's, it's tricky because the samples, uh, you often don't have tumor and normal tissue samples available you're lucky if you get anything out of this so the likelihood that you get both tumor and tissue samples and normal tissue is very low so unfortunately also i think the grant that we tried applying for was actually not granted so i think at least from our side i don't know of any other project working on topics like that yeah in principle it is it is possible it is possible in principle yes Okay, and then you mentioned a variety of input, uh, a diverse set of input files that, that you can feed into the pipeline as an input. Uh, Maxime wanted to know whether you could also use CRAM files. Sadly, well, I've not tested it, but I think at the moment, likely not, at least in Ego version two, so the DSL one version, mainly because there's a lot of these tools which were developed a long time ago and are not yet developed and not using the latest HTS lib um, uh, libraries, uh, which supports the CRAM files. However, with DSL 2, I am currently considering maybe pruning back some of the software we offer um, because these, these tools have been abandoned. And even if people still sometimes use them, I don't think it's worth necessarily keeping them um, maintained. So possibly in the future, I'd certainly like to, that'd be really um, nice to have for sure. Okay, so I don't see any more questions coming up again. Um, so thanks again, James. And I'd also like to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for funding the series of talks and NF Core events. Um, I'd also like to say that we've, an, we've had an overwhelming number of registrants for our upcoming hackathon, and we're in the process of working out some of the final details. So we will be in touch with you soon if you've signed up. And for those of you who've signed up to receive a gift bag at the hackathon, we have something special for you and it'll be sent to you in a couple of weeks. So join us again next week for a bite-sized talk by Nick Servant on the NF Core High C pipeline. And see you then. <laughs>